Okay, so what happens when something that is the great defender of privacy and of identity becomes our attacker? So in this presentation, we'll look at how encryption has flipped to become the attacker rather than the defender. So we're starting to see ransomware as a significant threat vector. So it may be that uh, an attacker may uh, find a way in through spear phishing or through a remote desktop, but ransomware and data exfiltration will often be the, the end target and then for there to be a follow-up ransomware request. So we saw it with Travelex, in fact, it brought down the company because they couldn't cope with the ransomware attack on the network. With WannaCry and the NHS, uh, we saw systems being downed and there could have been a threat to life if it had been more significant. And with Garmin too, there was significant brand damage uh, overall. So it's increasingly becoming a significant threat for cyber, the cybersecurity industry. So in the presentation, I'll outline uh, an example of healthcare and ransomware and show that every single industry is affected by ransomware in some way and healthcare probably as much as any other. Then I'll do a little bit of the basics of cryptography, how it works why it is such a great tool for privacy and identity, but how it can be flipped against us. Then we'll look at some of the basic types of ransomware, onto some samples, and in the end we'll look at what we can do to address some of the problems. So let's look at healthcare and ransomware, just as a specific use case, and see if we can see uh, where the threats might come. So with ransomware, uh, we have our malicious software, which can uh, a, a create significant profit for uh, an adversary. And it's obviously designed so that files, key files are encrypted so that it's not possible to recover them until a ransom is paid. But healthcare is a mine of sensitive information. There are uh, the bank details, uh, details of national insurance numbers held on uh, NHS systems. There are patient records, communication records for emails, vendor suppliers, equipment and devices and, and so on. This all looks to uh, creating a, a significant risk in terms of the sensitivity of the information in, involved. And ransomware itself is a global industry. It is thought that it cost businesses 169 billion over 2019. And healthcare is actually one of the most significant areas impacted, especially in the US. But we see professional services, software, public sector, real estate, and so on, all affected by this problem around ransomware. And it can also have fatal impacts that can lead to a, a loss of life. In Dusseldorf, uh, ransomware infected 30 servers in September. It also managed to crash systems and it forced the hospital to turn away emergency payments, uh, patients. And along with that, uh, there, there was one case where uh, a, a person lost their life because of the, uh, the impact of a ransomware attack. And so the grim reality is that we have high ransom de demands ever increasing and it can be costed in millions to some companies. An average downtime of 16 days in the case of Travelex, it was even more. And we also see the, the potential loss of data. If the files cannot be recovered again, then they may be lost forever. 
And as we've seen, there's a potential loss of life overall. But probably one of the biggest downsides is the reputational loss and the uh, costs involved in losses. And when it comes to conviction, the figures vary, but there is a very, very small uh, percentage of those who are involved in this that will actually be prosecuted. And overall, it's a Trojan horse, and it will enter as a Trojan horse into the network. It could start with a phishing campaign, and one and a person clicks on the email, and that will uh, enable uh, the malware to install itself. It could be a PDF or some JavaScript. It might be through uh, an exploit kit, such as a web, a web, uh, uh, a baiting uh, program on a website, or it could be from a remote desktop connection. In some way, the intruder will get into the network in some way, and then uh, look to uh, distribute the, the the ransomware and encrypt files. And healthcare itself is extremely vulnerable to ransomware. It can bring down uh, critical uh, infrastructure within inside the healthcare environment. It also has a broad surface area that now includes medical devices and even mobile phones. And on average, 5% of hospital IT budgets go into cybersecurity. Uh, but unfortunately, 82% of hospitals report breaches. And a medical record can be worth much, much more than a credit card to cyber criminals. And in the UK, we have one of the largest uh, public health care systems in the world and where there might be 55 million patient records. And the current valuation is that this could be as worth as much as five billion per year to an intruder and the prime target is of course ransomware so how could we prevent the next wanna cry well obviously staff education and awareness is key 94 percent of all malware is delivered through email increased investment in cybersecurity, and to look to embrace new technology and collaborate with academia on the more secure solutions. And when it comes to paying the ransom, uh, work has been done that shows that uh, up to 45% of organisations paid the ransom and got the data back. But unfortunately, 20% also paid and did not get the data back. And only 35% said that they did not pay the ransom. So let's look at some of the basics of uh, cryptography. And as part of that, we look at the concept of Bob and Alice. So Bob and Alice were, were created a while back in a paper by uh, Rivest, Shumir and Aldman, uh, who developed the RSA method. They defined that A will talk to B or Alice will talk to Bob. Bruce Schneier then developed these into a whole lot of different roles, such as Trent, the trust identity, Eve, who listens to the communications, Matheroy, who attacks Bob and Alice, Peggy, who proves something, and Victor, uh, who will verify things. So let's look at how we use cryptography to be able to keep things secret. For this, Bob and Alice need to communicate and they do this by uh, generating a shared key. We then use what's called symmetric key encryption, and typically that's in the form of AES, to be able to encrypt the data in some way and use the same key to be able to decrypt on the other end. As long as it's too difficult for Eve to find the keys, then we are fairly secure. We typically use 128 bits or 256 bit keys and which are too difficult for Eve to discover those. 
then we also have the concept of asymmetric encryption or public key encryption. Two common methods are the RSA method and elliptic curve cryptography or ECC. With this, we have a magical trapdoor where we have a public key and a private key. In this case, Alice can distribute her public key, a bit like a padlock on the data to anyone who wants to send her data and then Bob can encrypt with that public key. And the only key to decrypt that is the private key. Finally, we have hashing methods. And with the hashing method, we take data and create a one-way function, such as using MD5 or SHA-256 to create uh, an, an encrypted hash or a hash value. That's a fixed length value and really provides a fingerprint for the data that we have to make sure that we have integrity. We can also add what's called salt into this to make sure that the hash value changes each time we change the salt. So let's look at how ransomware might use these encryption methods. So Eve gets uh, Bob to click on your phishing email and then that might install a ransomware program on his system. Then the ransomware program will look for key files, so it probably doesn't want to shut down the computer, uh, so it will avoid things like executables or DLLs. For this, it will generate possibly a random key and a random salt value. It uses these to be able to then encrypt the file with the key that's been generated. And now Eve must get back this key and also relate it to the identifier of the computer. She might do this by taking the uh, symmetric key that's been generated and then encrypt it with her public key. That can then be sent back to Eve who will look at the identifier and also with the private key of the adversary, Eve in this case, will be able to be able to determine the encryption key involved. This involves a connection uh, that will be seen on the network as it as it dials back to the command and control system. Another method is for for the ransomware to be fairly self-contained. In this case, we could create the key that's going to be used for the symmetric encryption and then encrypt the data, then take the salt value and add it, say, to the start of the file, and then encrypt the key that's been used with the public key of Eve and add the identifier for the computer. Then there doesn't have to be a call back to Eve and it only needs to happen when Bob sends an example of the encrypted ransomware back to Eve. Eve will then examine uh, this part here and then with her private key will release the encryption key used and will be able to decrypt the file because she also has the salt value involved in the encryption process. In this way, uh, we do not see the connection happening to, to pass the key back and any key can be used here and every file can have its own unique key. What's required is the private key of uh, Eve. So let's look at some types of ransomware. For this we've got five main classifications. First one is a locker. And this will lock the computer so that it's not possible to be able to gain access to it. And then a special code will release the lock on the computer. This is the disadvantage is that the person can actually use the system while it's locked. More commonly, we have what's called a crypto ransomware. With this, uh, we require uh, a decryption key uh, to be able to unlock and to be able to recover the files that have been encrypted. 
We can also have a master boot record run somewhere, and that is where a, a message appears whenever the computer is started up. Also, web server encrypting run somewhere encrypts uh, files on a web server. And finally, uh, we can also have mobile device run somewhere. So the timeline shows a general advancement in ransomware methods. Uh, we see things like uh, Android locking appearing and a JavaScript uh, a ransomware, ones that target hospitals and, and, and so on. Each has advanced ransomware in some, some way and uh, has has generally uh, moved the technology uh, on. So this shows a fairly recent survey around the different types of uh, ransomware. The most popular method of infecting is spam with 39% uh, of uh, the ransomware methods. And while we see around 19.6% focusing on uh, corrupt web pages. So these are some of the recent ones. Uh, so here we have a Petcha uh, that's uh, spread through a fake software and a worm. Uh, we have Jigsaw, uh, spam there. Uh, Kerber uh, is often sp spread through fake software. And you can see each year there's new ones that, that come along, not Petcha, uh, WannaCry. WannaCry was, was propagated through Eternal Blue, uh, a, a weakness in the SMB Windows software causes this to, to propagate. But we can see there are many different methods here. Spam is obviously one of the top ones, but we also see RDP, Remote Desktop, and, and so on. In terms of the command and control, this is how the keys are typically uh, uh, sent back and, and how a command and control center can control the ransomware if possible. We can see generally there has been a static domain set up and in the term case of WannaCry, then that was the one thing that was able to switch WannaCry off because it was known what the static domain was that it was connecting to. But increasingly we see no contact with the command and control, which means that a detection software which is detecting the callback uh, will not be successful. When it comes to encryption, we see mostly as AES encryption using symmetric key uh, because it's fast. The infection method uh, varies here. Um, we can see that it's mainly Windows that's affected, but we often get uh, Android and Linux now and Mac OS infected too. Okay, so the, we can see that there is generally an increase in, in the, the number of these different types of, uh, me of ransomware methods. This is a fairly recent uh, timeline here. We see WannaCry in 2017, a static domain spread by a worm. And uh, NotPetya was fairly significant. Again, it was using this uh, this Eternal Blue uh, vulnerability. Bad Rabbit uh, was, had no command and control and looked at uh, compromised websites. We have things like fake flash players and so on spreading ransomware. And uh, uh, we can see generally that uh, the evolution is towards no command and control uh, uh, systems. So let's look at some ransomware examples uh, from the past and also fairly recent ones. So one of the first ones was this GP code, uh, which gave you this, this uh, message uh, here to say that uh, the files had been uh, encrypted. And then we commonly see uh, uh, messages such as this, 
where we see a, a strong focus on, on law enforcement and credibility to make it look as if it's a, an actual a law enforcement uh, website where actually it's a, it's a ransomware threat. And with the, the, the rev, with the money pack uh, ransomware uh, message, we even saw a webcam enabled uh, software where it was possible whenever the user had been infected, they could make a, a webcam connection to, uh, to the, 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 the entities who were uh, spreading the ransomware. And actually, each of these could be customized for the different regions and countries and languages in, in, the, in the different worlds. So these show, show examples from the US, uh, from the UK, and also uh, from other, other countries. A few examples are here. We can see the different, uh, different languages that are used and there's the, the webcam, and they are customized for different regions of the world. And one of the most serious uh, ransomware attacks was CryptoWall. With CryptoWall, you had a whole industry that actually defined the delivery, the infection, the network infrastructure, and also the financial payment uh, a infrastructure to be able to integrate all of this into a, a crime by service. So someone could create a full campaign of the delivery method, the, we infected, the infrastructure involved, and then the payment method, uh, and and obviously make the whole infrastructure easier to integrate for, for cyber criminals. Kerber was, was one of the most significant uh, around and it was strange that there is a blacklist of countries which shouldn't be targeted. It also set up an affiliate program so it was possible to, uh, to define a campaign with a number of uh, affiliates. And with this, well, there was no need to, to contact the command and control uh, system and it generally tried uh, to integrate speech, text-to-speech uh, modules, which allowed the, uh, the system to speak to the user so that they could make the, the payments. So let's look at an evidence bag here. Okay, so this shows us a, a ransomware evidence bag for uh, Kerber. In this case, it's been captured using this, the Cuckoo Sandbox. So the Cuckoo Sandbox will isolate the ransomware from the internet. It will, it will uh, listen to com the uh, network conversations and it will also register for Okay, this is uh, an example of a ransomware evidence bag. So in this case, we've used Cuckoo and we've isolated the ransomware uh, from the internet uh, so that Cuckoo will gather all of the network traffic, all of the files changed and so on, uh, so that we can analyze them. So it captures the, uh, the PCAP, uh, the network traffic, and this is an example here and uh, we can see here there's a lot of uh, UDP traffic involved, uh, some pinging, and this is, the, this is the traffic which is generated from the device. We can see here there are some ARP uh, activity, there is some uh, DNS uh, things that happen, so this is trying to contact uh, a DNS uh, server, possibly with the with some sort of commanding throw, or a scanning across the network to be able to connect to other other systems. But then we can look at the report to be able to see what's actually in the 
uh, the ransomware report. So for this, we will uh, look at registry keys that are changed. Uh, we can look at the files which have been read, files which have been modified, and, and, and so on. So the report should produce this. Okay, so there's our, our screenshots, and we can see here, this is the point at which the ransomware is infected. So if we go here, so we can see here, uh, this is our infection here with the Kerber ransomware 4.15, and this is the screen that the user would uh, actually uh, see. Along with this, we can look at the files which have been uh, modified. So these are the files that have been dropped on the system. See, there are many of those. And then we can identify all the files that have been read. So in this case, uh, the ransomware is focusing on certain folders on the system and also certain file types, such as PowerPoint, PDF, Python files, and, and so on. So this gives us a strong understanding about the ransomware. Along with this, we can see the hosts that were involved and any DNS requests that have been made to be able to analyze this, the HTTP requests that have gone out uh, onto, the, onto the network, and then finally the ping requests. And we can see there's been a lot of scanning uh, going on, and this is the uh, ping request type. Okay, so you can see it's useful to be able to, to use Cuckoo to be able to understand the uh, uh, the operation of our ransomware. Okay, so that's an example of the Kerber uh, ransomware, and we can see that uh, it's uh... <coughs> okay. So that's an example of the Kerber uh, ransomware and how we can capture it with inside C Cuckoo. Uh, Locky is another example here. This is the, an example of the email that someone might receive, and we can see here it has an attachment which is obviously infected uh, with a, a backdoor onto uh, the system. It was used uh, to infect uh, the Hollywood Medical Center and infected things like CT scans, emergency rooms, and so on. One of the first run, uh, JavaScript ones that was created was Random32 and it generally went out and uh, uh, found these file types and encrypted them, all running from a, a web page. So overall we have a kill chain model when it comes to ransomware uh, and we'll, it will generally go through the these uh, eight, eight stages. The initial entry onto the host uh, might be in many different ways, gaining executing privileges, then generating uh, uh, the encryption keys and the salt value. It then identifies the host of interest by scanning the system, performs the data modification by encrypting the files, uh, creates a denial of the critical data by doing this encryption, then it tries to protect the cryptographic secrets, the salt and the keys, and then it tries to possibly maintain a functional payment uh, channel, usually through cryptocurrency. When it comes to the generation of the keys, there's actually many, several different methods from the static uh, asymmetric key generation to uh, the more common ones, which are dynamically generated keys. And each year there has been uh, different types of, uh, of ransomware created with different types of keys here. In this case for NotPetya, WannaCry and Kerber, they used uh, dynamically generated uh, keys using this uh, crypto API here. And at the current time, this is some research that looked at the number of infections in Q3 2020, and we can see that this ransomware here had, had a vast majority of the randomware infections.
and also with infections. Then taking the others, we can see that Phobos, uh, Revo, and so on are, are still fairly popular in terms of their uh, impact. Uh, a new case uh, of ransomware is the Av Avadon ransomware, and we will typically see an email like this with a zip file, and then with these types of uh, messages associated with it. And also another recent one was Gand Crab, and uh, the creators cr uh, made so much money uh, quickly that it was said they, they retired in, at the end of May 2019 uh, with over two billion dollars made since um, the previous year. So how can we protect against uh, ransomware? Well obviously education is one of the most important areas and we need to make sure that our users do not click on any malware uh, so that it spreads across the network. We need backups, and one way of uh, defining this is a 3 to one We have three copies of any, any file in two different formats and at least one uh, off-site uh, copy. We can also layer the defences of our, our, of our network to make sure that uh, uh, we reduce the propagation of, uh, of uh, malware and also segment our network up into different areas so that it's not possible for the malware to jump across. And obviously we need to probably focus on uh, having whitelists uh, as opposed to, to blacklists for our applications. Okay, so that's been an overview of uh, encryption and how the great defense becomes the attacker.